so after we recorded this week's episode, we thought that there may be some extra context that would at least make the uh, conversation a lot more interesting uh, and maybe may clarify some things that may seem like they're not uh, culturally sensitive, but when you really think about the perce- perspective that C is talking from, uh, you'll get a sense that it's actually a different imperialist perspective, I think, is the best way to summarize it. But you, you, you had some stuff you wanted to, to tell us beyond that, and I have the original message that you sent me if, that, that I can use to sort of get some questions in as well. Yeah, actually, I also want to look at the messages. <laughs> yeah. No, it was it, it you it was pretty deep. Uh, let me see. I don't know what I was I was clarifying that like because you, you mentioned that um, communist countries didn't really get a fair chance because mm. democracies in the world were sanctioning them, right? Yeah. And then I guess I wanted to clarify that like in China's case, I don't think that was the case. Well, they were right. isolated a lot more, right? Right, they 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 were, yeah. Yeah, I it's think it's also that... like voluntary, and like they were given the I I felt I feel like they were given a chance to cooperate, and I don't feel like they wanted communism because they feel like it was the altruistic thing to do. At least the people in power, you know. No, I definitely I uh well I in the, on the show we do have a distinction between a communist state and a communist society. Communist society being stateless and a communist state being a socialist state by, run by a communist party. So, yeah, no, I, I well I think you are also saying some stuff that was interesting. So, I totally understand. Yeah. I don't think that uh, the authoritative uh perspective of the Chinese government is like altruistic at all. Uh, especially when you start going into like erasing historical contexts and stuff, right? Uh, yeah. You know, like disconnecting from history. That's traditionally a su- like I think that there's a lot of stuff that's thrown around and um, is not necessary. Like I think fascism is not appropriate in this case because fascism is a right wing perspective. Authoritarianism is. I think that like. Fascism actually comes from the uh, Italian word for fascio, which is like a bundle of sticks. So like it is about unification and stuff like that, but also from a very right wing perspective. So so, yeah, I I would never I I think that socialist programs are helpful, uh, you know, like universal programs and stuff like that. Um, but you were also concerned that that the, that there was like some sense of like uh, the China virus and 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 like that maybe some of the things you were saying were going to be misinterpreted as being uh, xenophobic uh, as opposed to like because you were saying something about how Chinese is actually like the equivalent of white people over here. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah, and that, that I found that interesting because I'd never heard that that discussion. Well, I want to clarify that concept a little more. It's like Chinese people as a term, like that's extremely misleading because imagine like in such a huge land in China, like how could all these different tribes and ethnic groups, like going back thousands of years, know each other and thought that they're the same people? You know what I mean? Like that's just a leap of logic. But like that's how history, that's how Chinese history is taught. And that's how Chinese history is taught to kids, like in China and in Hong Kong, and like you know, yeah. So and that's that it's always it, been been unified. They give us the um, they imply or they give us the um, the idea that like we're descended from one single ethnic group. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And like, well, I mean, like, especially with a landmass so big, it's probably not the case, right? Yeah, people spoke different languages, people live differently, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, it's just strange to assume that, like, we're all the same people. And they yeah. give us this idea, and they want us to believe that, and they, they, like, nowadays, like, what China does is, like, they make everyone learn in Mandarin in school. Mm. Which is, I'm like, a- just one of many, many dialects of Sino languages. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, here, let's go back to the. Or do you have the text there? I don't. 
Uh, yeah, it's hard I don't to know do how it, to well, put it up on Skype <laughs> while we're on the call. Uh, yeah, so I th- I find that really interesting. It it makes sense, and I think it goes back to like especially bringing back the the thing about fascism and fascio and how that whole thing started. Um, it is uh, tying that into like the nationalism because I think Italy wasn't a nation. You know, it- Italy was city states for a very long time. And then it was 60 years before, I think, they became fascist that they weren't even a country, a nation for like longer than, um, you know, 60 years before they became fascists. And it was like sort of a part of the unification rhetoric, right? That kind of uh, ultimately it was like Vittorio Emanuele that unified all of Italy all of the the regions and made it a nation and then 60 years later you have Mussolini like in the 1920s you have the futurists and they're all headed it towards this like very uh nationalist ideal of breaking with the past so there's a lot of similarity I think that you know I think one of the things that is not really discussed and especially since we're talking about the way that we're taught is that it's like you know right now it's really hard for people who are uh, students to just like um, become students to begin with, you're already saddled with this crazy amount of debt. And one of the things is that like elite uh, education being like maintained only for the elite and being accessible only to elite people, uh, which is something that is like happening in this country that's kind of fascist that we're not necessarily discussing as fascism because we have the shiny clown in the orange hat, right? <laughs> or in, in the orange uh, skin. But like, but I, I do think that's interesting. Do you, do you have any, any thoughts like that go deeper into how, uh, I guess it, would it, it, would it be a homogenized ethnic, uh, cult, you know, like what it's, is that, is it what you're talking about? Like a, a melting pot, thing that the result of like a melting pot or is that even not an accurate way to try to describe it it's more than that i feel like it's like it's like giving people the false perception that like you're all like genetically the same Uh you know what i mean and culturally the same by like slowly erasing your past yeah you know your ancestral past and like and it does eventually become reality you know, yeah. like how many dialects have died in China? Like it's happening in Xinjiang right now or East Turkestan and it's happening to like Mongolians. Like, so East Turkestan is interesting because it has the Turkestan. What, uh, how what's their proximity to Russia and stuff? I actually don't know Chinese geography that well. I just I didn't even know that there was a place in China called uh, that had a stan like, you know. Afghanistan yeah, it's like and where all... all the stands are. Like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like those people, they they look kind of Asian, but like they also look like they're Eurasians. You know what I mean? So they uh. don't even like we make fun of it in Hong Kong in the way like, dude, they don't even look Chinese. Why are you telling them that they're Chinese? <laughs> you know, whatever look Chinese means, you know. Like, yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying though. Yeah. But that's that's really fascinating. Uh, any, anything else you want to add in this little intro that, uh, before we start the episode, cause I, you really did, uh, bring a lot. I still haven't listened to it yet again. Um, but you did school me on it. And I think that I appreciate this little tidbit of like, cause it is, I mean, it would be like saying that we're all ethnically the same in the U S to some degree, right? Even, you know, uh, cause that includes Mexicans, that includes Costa Ricans, you know, like that includes everybody that would typically migrate. Like, I guess it's a denial of borders to some degree, or just like, uh, uh, borders being arbitrary to begin with. Right. Uh-huh. Like where you're, where you're just kind of just saying like, oh, we're all American, but clearly that's not the fucking case. By the way, we're recording this little preamble, like the day after the election and we still don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. what's going to happen to the world. So, <laughs> so yeah, like it's a, it's a little, di- like it's totally different in the case of the U S though, cause people intermarry willingly, you know what I mean? But like in China, okay. like there's that history of like systematically, um, you know, like taking the women and you know marrying them or like you know killing the men and then marrying the women and then making children that are hybrids and then you tell the kids that like now you are han chinese okay and that's actually happening in east Turkestan. it's crazy it's still happening right now 
It's ha- like they kidnapped a man, put him in education camp, re-education camp, whatever. Like it's a concentration camp, honestly. And yeah, then yeah. They would put a Chinese Han, ethnically Han Chinese official, party official, in the home. Okay. And I mean, I don't know, like. Obviously, that that lady would be distressed, right? Like the woman of the house would be really distressed that the husband's taken away, and now mm. there's this man living with her. Okay, that's fucking and, weird. Yeah, and like news is like it's hard to like get actual news in a place like that. You know, there's no real journalists working yeah. there. You know. Well, they're trying like, to do that over here too. Yeah, as far as I know, like you know, they are doing that that same thing that they've done like pre dynasties, like during dynasties, like they make children, they make hybrid children and then the children will be called Han Chinese. And they're basically like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know mm-hmm. what, what to call it. Like ethnic cleansing, like by marriage or yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. It's, it's not marriage, you know, like, yeah, it's, uh, it, there's definitely like, yeah, a forceful nature to it as well. Yeah. But like in the U S like, let's, let's just like, you know, say like, you know, later on, we're all going to be, like, brown people because we're just all, like, mixed yeah. together and we, like, consider ourselves ethnic- ethnically the same, like, you know, like, some weird utopia future vision. But, like, you know, but that would happen because we did it willingly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Not because someone took our husbands and put another guy in our house and have sex okay. with us, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe rape is more appropriate, but I get what you're yeah. saying. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you'd like uh, people to understand about? Well, that that's fascinating because I think over here there's like a generational forgetfulness. And obviously our media doesn't remind us about things that have happened in the past that are relevant to the moments that are happening right now. But um, it seems like this is an even more aggressive like... First, we hide your history from you, and then we become your history. It's a pretty aggressive, like, Uh um, ours is more, is done with a little bit, like, less of a, of a, of a, an aggressive, of a firm hand. They just starve us. They still, like, you know, but over here, it's, it's crazy. Uh, I'd never heard of any of this. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah, and it's not a new thing. The thing is, like, this tactic existed, like, long before they start doing it now, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I like, think that that... Like, even me, like, my, ethni- my ethnicity, like, my sub-ethnic group is Cantonese, right? Like, I'm ethnically Chinese, but, like, my sub-ethnic group is Cantonese. And Cantonese people is a hybrid of, like, you know, those, like, South China people that, like, are more ethnically close to, like, Vietnamese and, like, Thai people now. Mm-hmm. You know, like when they were invaded, some of them fled to Vietnam and, you know, that that region. Yeah. And the ones that remained intermarried into Han Chinese, um, the ethnic group. And like what resulted is Cantonese people. So is Han still the predominant um, uh, like genetic lineage? Um, I've read that like Cantonese people are actually ethnically... I mean, uh, genetically, like, there are differences. Like, we're prone to certain diseases. You know, like, you can actually scientifically find that, you know? Mm-hmm. But it's also, like, we've intermarried for so long that, like, Can- Cantonese people are considered Han Chinese. Okay. But, like, we're also Cantonese. Are there... But is, it's like a subgroup. Cantonese it, is the subgroup. But where does Han fit into that? Like, is all of Chinese considered Han because of the dynasty spreading? That's Sorry if that's... Tell- that's what they tell. So that okay. So that is what the narrative is. Yeah, that's crazy. So Wait, and, and when when was the Han? It, when huh? was the Han Dynasty? I don't remember. I mean, probably BC. Okay. Like, yeah. So then, that's so weird. So then, what is it like a selective thing of history where they're like, oh well, you know, like because obviously what we know about the uh, the Cultural Revolution is that a lot of people were. Uh, broken from their history right and uh-huh. uh um but is that like it sounds like there is some acknowledgement of the past in some way so is it like it's not just a complete break but it's like maybe a reimagining a reinterpretation of like what h- how history fits into the cultural moment how how do they how do they reconcile um you know erasing history but then also 
saying that we're all Han from like the BC dynasties. They're not saying we're all Han from the BC dynasty. They're just saying we're Han. Okay, so they and don't. They they're... You, they, and they give you this like pseudo legend kind of thing about how like we're descended from the dragons or blah 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 and all okay. that. You know, like okay. and all those like communist like Chinese communist songs and stuff like that in the lyrics. Yeah, yeah. 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 And like, um, yeah, I don't know how they like. I mean, there's always like a, a lot of like leap of logic, you know. But also like, I didn't study Chinese history that was written by Chinese people, like. I mean, it was written by Chinese people, but it's also, like, with a lot of help from, like, American and, like, you know, Western researchers in general. Mm. Like, because China itself, actually, like, even right now, they censor a lot of their academics in terms of, like, writing about their own history. Because there's so many revolutions that have happened, right? Because there were mm. so many dynasties, so many times that people, like, revolted against an authority, and mm. establish a new dynasty and they don't yeah. want to write that history they don't want to like write a you know a essay about that history and tell people that like give people the idea that like oh you can actually revolt against authority if you don't like <laughs> it <laughs> so like even then like there was a lot of disputes over how to characterize a lot of the revolutions in the past you mm. know what i mean yeah yeah like okay. what to call a revolution and what to call a riot you know? Yeah, yeah. 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 And I definitely want to, if uh, if the impression that I leave in this episode is that communism, uh, uh, like communist states are good and that they're altruistic, I definitely want to make sure that people understand that I do not think that. I actually, you know, like I grew up Cuban, so there's definitely a fucking problem with, uh, I think that in the context of like a country like the US and a lot of Latin American countries, there is an, uh, a thing where socialism, non-communist socialism, it, it seems to be beneficial because it's sort of the only way of people uh, claiming their own uh, natural resources. Whereas like now we kind of have this attitude towards the world in America where it's like, yeah, that shit ain't yours. You know, it belongs to the global financial markets and uh, your government is an inconvenience. But in terms of like and so in terms of that, I think that. Uh, you know, I think that in, there's a big difference between communism and, uh, and uh, communist states, which obviously are totalitarian and if you really had a communist society it would not have a state it would look a lot like anarchy uh the problem that i have with the world right now is that we've gone the other way and that we live in anarcho-capitalism which is everything is privatized <laughs> you know so yeah. so there's like that uh, like i said it's all it, it's definitely i am definitely not pro like america becoming a communist state or do i think that like china is i do think that there's possible there's a possibility that we're ramping up a cold war with them again uh, or like we did with russia that might not be beneficial to either side uh i also think that you know but at the same time i'm not like oh yeah 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 china is our salvation because i am they, they're doing a lot of shit that uh companies like microsoft used to do in africa of like doing these goodwill missions that are really you know ways of the economic Implement colonization. Yeah, and uh, and what's it called? IT implementation and infrastructure building that sort of traps people into these systems that maybe are not beneficial to them. And who knows? Are they going to start exporting the social credit system? Like all that shit is not good, you know. So there, so uh, just there is a distinction between uh, communist states and communism that you can always go research into in more depth. And sometimes I just forget that people don't know that. But yeah. All right. Thank you yeah, so much. The word communism and socialism are like the same to people. people yeah. People don't really like distinct those sometimes, you know? No, it, they don't. And uh, and I think that that is part of the war that I'm talking about, like where it's like, I think that on a on a I think that there's. It's it's just like any time you talk about you, you vilify communism and socialism, you're basically coming from a right wing standpoint that I am always skeptical of because, uh, you know, like it's one thing for my Cuban ancestors who live in Miami now or, you know, my, my, my people that are of Cuban descent that live in Miami be having a very visceral reaction to uh, 
you know, communism and stuff like that. But at the same time, um, they the ones that came over here are probably the wealthier class, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Who had the means to get out. And so that perspective needs to also be tempered. Like, it's valid, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, you know. And uh, and when you're like a little fucking island against the, an imperialist state like uh, the U.S., you know, it's a fight you probably shouldn't pick. <laughs> <laughs> and when you do, you're probably going to become authoritarian, <laughs> yeah. you know, and so just to like kind of keep control. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm not saying anything pro-communist here at all. I'm also not. I'm, but I also think that, like, you know, we should have m- health care. <laughs> yeah. You, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So we're I on the I same like page. Do <laughs> you like Canada? <laughs> I've like never Canada. been. All right. <laughs> Well, enjoy the episode, guys, and uh, what's it called? Yeah, uh, here we go. Welcome to What's My Thesis. I am your host, Javier Proenza. Every week, my guests and I share the answers we found to the questions we have. Join us as we explore and expand our worldview through research and ask, what's my thesis? And uh, I uh, actually today did research how to pronounce your name for the first time I've I've never done. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I I was concerned because there are no consonants in your first name. Yes. And uh, um, so is it she? No. (laughs) No? Oh, man. Ah, fuck Google. (laughs) Yeah, Google, I don't think Google carry Cantonese. And so any kind of Chinese pronunciation they're going to give you is just going to be Mandarin. And there's way too many dialects of Chinese. Oh, Jesus. Okay. So, well, I, uh, um, that just makes me feel like I should never try. (laughs) Well, actually the name that I do give people, like the pronunciation of my name that I do give people, is not the exact pronunciation in Cantonese neither, because I feel like it's basically impossible for native English speakers to pronounce my name correctly consistently. Really? Uh, So can you say your name for me? And I haven't said your last name either. Uh, Is it Cam? Is that, uh... uh, I mean that's what I give people, but that's not how you say it either. <laughs> okay, cool. So that is 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 that your like Americanized version of your name then, the Cam? Yeah, pretty. Much. I, I just want people to be able to say my name consistently. That's what I want. Like I don't want everyone to have a different pronunciation. Yeah, so yeah. I just tell people that my name is Z Cam, but the correct way to say those two words is actually Z Gum. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for yeah. taking me through that. I, I, I can sort of relate, but I can imagine that your life is a lot more difficult. Although I did grow up uh, with the name Javier in a country that doesn't have the letter, letter J. So. Right. <laughs> so so that's why I was like, I have no idea how to approach this. But uh, I've learned that Google is not the way to go about anything ever again. <laughs> that's my lesson. Uh, yeah, for Chinese, definitely. For like, Chinese? I- yeah, I use it to help me translate passages sometimes, but um, yeah, they're, they're, I don't know if it, it does it for other languages, but like the last time I tried to translate the word countryman, it gave me like Chinese people or something. Oh, okay. Like, so it's like, it translates from like a Chinese centric, but you know, but I'm already yeah. using like, cause there's two versions of Google, um, two versions of Chinese on Google Translate, traditional and simplified. Mainland China doesn't use simplify. I mean, mainland China uses Simplify. It doesn't use traditional. I use traditional. And traditional is used in Hong Kong and Taiwan mostly. Mm -hmm. And so when I type in the word countryman in traditional, shouldn't they translate as like Taiwanese people if they're using like a country-centric thing? You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So that's insane. And Taiwan people speak Mandarin mostly as well. So. Well, you know, when when I was a kid, I was always very curious about China, especially because I think back then uh, in the eighties, it was a little bit more mysterious to the to to like Americans like me. Uh, and yeah. and my dad said that, or, or this is just like a story that I heard years ago, so I could be getting it all fucked up. But um, he told me that like when he would go to hotels over there, he was a diplomat, or uh, I mean, he's alive, but he's just retired, and he. Um, he would go and tip so that he could navigate the city because there was uh, not that much English spoken in mainland China. They would just give him like a drawing of the hotel or I mean the the the, the characters of the hotel written out so that he could show uh-huh. it to people because he, they, they just knew he wasn't going to be able to fucking right. interact. Um, yeah. But that's crazy to me because like now we're like, you know, from that experience to now hearing you talk about how difficult it is to sort of 
you, you, I mean, one of the things that we also talk about on the show a lot is like how communities and cultures are not monoliths. And I do think that right now, even though there's like, like, I think that people don't necessarily have a, uh, I don't, or at least I don't have an accurate concept of what it's like to live in mainland China. Uh, whereas like, I think that we tend to think about Hong Kong as this bastion of freedom, but it's also a former colony. Oh which yeah. Which is kind of fucking fun. weird, you know? So I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't lived in mainland China either. I'm from Hong Kong and okay. I lived there for 13 years before I moved to Houston. And I've okay. also been in the States for 13 years as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And why Houston? Just out of curiosity, because like um, everybody, I, I, it always blows my mind when like where people move. You know, I had a, a Mexican friend that uh, or on the show that went that moved to Baltimore and I was like, what? <laughs> so I'm not so, shitting on Houston. <laughs> that oh, wasn't yeah. like a. I think it's I think Houston has a lot of immigrants because their tax is pretty low. Right. And also it's like and maybe like previous people have already moved there and it just like became more convenient. At, at least that's the case for my aunts. Um, my first aunt, my, my oldest aunt moved to Houston first and she moved because after the 1989 Tiananmen Square, a lot of Hong Kong people were thinking about immigration. A lot of them did move. Mm -hmm. And so she moved first. And then when she got here, her sister, my second aunt also moved and they moved like before the Hanover in 1997. So what's Hanover? Oh, the Hanover is the Hanover of Hong Kong back to China from the British. Oh, the handover. Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. um, what's it called? So, so then, what was the what's the tr cultural transition? Because I mean, now I, I, my other question is like the same as the one about China is like, what's Houston really like? How diverse I, is it? I I didn't really go out in Houston. I was in high school the whole time, mm -hmm. and my aunt like our going out just consisted of like going to Chinatown to get groceries and like, you know, getting brunch, you know, dim sum or something. Wow. But I didn't really like go out nor like did I socialize enough with my friends to the degree because they, they already went to middle school together, you know, and I don't have that like close friendship with people in high school. And uh -huh. so like, I didn't like, you know, hitch a ride with somebody to go out to town or anything like that. Like my life just consisted of like, math club and like st studying for AP classes and like, you know, just like homeschool, homeschool. Like that's, that's my whole life in Houston. Really? Yeah. And then where does the art come in? Um, I took AP art when I was uh, a senior in high school. And then, um, there's such I mean, a, th always... hold on. There's such a thing as advanced placement art. I'd never heard that. Oh yeah. I got a four <laughs> out of five. <laughs> And it's the same portfolio that I ended up using to apply for the art major in UT. But I actually got into UT as like chemical engineering as at first. Uh -huh. But um, I switched after orientation because I just realized this is like not what I want to do. Even though like I, I was like really good at math and I was like valedictorian in high school. And mm. um, I'm not trying to like relive my glory days right now. But... No, this is it's fascinating because it's like uh, I I mean. The, the uh, another example of like that I can think of is like uh, I mean and it's obviously not parallel but uh, like I I was a, I grew up as the son of a diplomat so my interactions with Rome were very intimate I was like in the mix of the city whereas like people that were it went to military school lived on a base they had access to all American foods and stuff like you know and so it seems like. It's it's just fascinating to me when when that when you can do that right like you can uh, sort of stay isolated within your culture in a different place. It makes me think of like embassies, you know, <laughs> where it's like sacred ground, uh, or like it's it's foreign soil, not sacred ground. But it was also different in that my aunts they didn't live in like Sugarland; they lived in like Channel View area, and so like. I went to a high school that had majority black and brown population, so that's actually my first experience. Okay. Of um, the United States and the principal was black and um, but most of the teachers were still white especially for AP classes uh -huh. and uh, so it, it, I didn't I actually I was shocked when I moved to Austin for UT because there were way more way way more white people at UT than my high school you know oh really yeah. so it was like getting into the real world 
<laughs> yeah, a little bit. And I was shocked how people didn't really study. It was more about partying than studying. It felt like you know yeah. at first. Yeah. Did you ever cut loose? Did you? I mean, I come from a very party cult. I, Miami is like, you you have to really work hard to dodge that shit. Uh, like, did you did you ever like? I mean, because that's kind of a stereotype of being an artist. That's that's why I ask. Partying. Yeah, really? you know, like <laughs> smoke weed, bro. <laughs> Eat yeah, some mushrooms, no, um, man. I did it in different ways. Like I didn't. I never really liked being in a party situation, and I don't really like doing drugs. Like I've tried it, but like you know, it's not my thing. Yeah. Uh, but like I, I did other things. Like, um, I definitely experiment experimented a lot with like sex. I was really promiscuous, and oh. then I got and I got into some kind of sex work, but. And then I also convinced myself that it's it's a lot about the research as well. <laughs> yeah. Do you, so. do you feel comfortable talking about that? Because I'm definitely I mean, I curious. I didn't do it for very long, you know? Uh-huh. And at the end of the day, I just felt like my temperament didn't fit that. <laughs> kind of work, you know? Like, I, I just... Yeah. I, I mean, it's just my opinion. And I, I know that there are people who feel differently about, about it, especially, like, people who are sex workers. But, like, I just, at the end of the day, look down too much on the clients, you know? I felt yeah. like... And I, I didn't feel like, and this is my way of looking at it. I don't feel like consent is something that should be bought, you know? Yeah, and I understand that's interesting. People are in different situations where they can actually choose clients or whatever. But I feel like a lot of the times people can't really choose, you know? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we definitely don't, don't have to get into all the politics of that. I was just curious because you brought it up and it's, a, it's an interesting um, thing that is like, uh, I, I mean, I think that like, it's interesting having it's hard to have a relationship with a customer ever if you don't respect them, which I yeah. can relate to in other industries. So at, at like, and you know, like just even with coaching, <laughs> yeah, I didn't have the, te- have the temperament for that. that you're doing, you know, so. what's that? Or even just like feeling like what you're doing is right for yourself. Not like if yeah. other people do it, like I, I can respect them, but like yeah. for some reason I can't, do it in myself you know what i mean that's why i stopped doing it yeah yeah no i totally get that um and then so uh well do you have a specific topic for today that you wanted to discuss hold on i wrote it down because it's kind of like like a complicated (laughs) sentence okay so the role of imagination in building traditions and identity and how it can liberate a people while also limit our expression of self okay so you went to university of texas huh Mm-hmm. repping yeah. hard i like it it's a it's a really good academic title and like now i know what we're gonna talk about <laughs> i know like my friends and i joke we're like we went to the lamborghini of public school <laughs> <laughs> and get it like longhorn and like lamborghini <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing yeah, yeah no i i'm into it though that because like i mean it's almost like you kind of answered all my questions right up top. <laughs> what were your questions? <laughs> well, no, like I mean, I I get what we what like I was like like it's so concise and so like um I I just kind of want to hand the reins over to you because like yeah I get what you're saying how like imagination I mean it's all in there I can almost even repeat it, it how imagination affects traditions and also but that and, and in ways that can like inhibit and i mean this is a paraphrase obvious at, but also empower mm-hmm. is that is that so, something like what you, you were saying that's definitely part of it but like i mean it manifests in so many ways right mm-hmm. like like a lot of traditions are imagined like they actually don't have roots as deep as we seem to make it sound like like it's definitely not as like we give it this really revered status, like traditions, the idea of traditions, especially for like a culture and a people. But like a lot of the times those things are actually made up, you know, by mm-hmm. maybe intellectuals or like people higher up and to instill a sense of like nationalism within a people so that well, you can unite. And sometimes like that can help you accomplish great things. But also sometimes it can, especially for immigrant kids, I feel like the experience is like, well, then I get stereotyped, right? Yeah. Well, do, do uh, what would be an example specifically of, of traditions that you're talking about? I mean, I guess I can speak for myself, like Asian people or like Chinese people specifically, like mm. um, traditions. We can say that like, oh, like we're we're very um, academic focused, like we are uh, very studious and people 
give us that you know stereotype mm-hmm. but it is it is true it does have cultural roots mm-hmm. but it's also like well part of that is also like like well what does academically focused mean like i mean if you take it way way back what did those chinese scholars mean what did what did those like confucian philosophers like what did they mean by like you know being studious or like being um like being into researching or being into intellectual pursuits they meant different things they don't mean being good at like scoring very high at the sat Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Like they were into like open thinking. They were into like you know, like writing poet, like writing poetry and like essays. That that that's more like humanities focused, right? Yeah. But now in Asian culture, what that means is like well, being good at math, like basically go going into STEM uh, uh STEM fields, right? STEM. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. STEM. Yeah. Um, and so, that makes me want to ask, um, like. Because you're talking about basically how uh, scholarship is being reinterpreted, essentially. Uh, again, to paraphrase and simplify, oversimplify something that you're saying that's very profound. But um, what I want to know is, like, is it fair to, to for me to associate some of that with the Cultural Revolution? I know that you're from Hong Kong, but... Oh, yeah, Definitely. Okay, and can you like give us so that I don't sound stupid, and uh, like your interpretation I mean, of what I that was? I also don't want to sound stupid. I'm also just researching this stuff. Myself, so. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, like I, I, I'm not afraid to sound stupid about like Latin American issues. <laughs> but, you yeah, know, I mean, but, let's yeah. agree on we're just figuring out stuff. You know, yeah, yeah, okay for sure. But like, but so what? But I mean, I also know what the Western propagandistic approach to it is right and like like for what perfect example i feel very comfortable talking about cuban uh, like communist uh american imperialist policy towards communist nations and like the idea of coups because i have cultural uh, uh like there's cultural disruption that comes from that right mm-hmm. and so i am also a generation away from the refugees so I can I have like the privilege of just seeing it also from outside of itself and recognizing that like that situation is much more com- complicated than that than just like oh Castro was an evil person you know um and everybody and he was the one that was directly starving everybody without factoring in years of embargo blockades and stuff like that right uh-huh. so so like that's I, I mean, you know, if I heard a white person talking about it, like if they were, you know, actually, I did hear this comedian, Andrew Schultz, sort of make a really interesting point that I always make is that like Cubans are very Republican. Right. And I'm not. So where's that disconnect for me is involved in that discussion about like communist politics in within Cuba. Right. And so I'm always very interested because like obviously China is has a communist party. And I think that one of the things that people talk about when they think about China now is that it's like, oh, it's like a capitalist capitalist society. But no, it's actually technically a socialist society run by a communist party, which is what a communist state is, whereas a communist society, as I understand it, is stateless, which is why you associate uh, anarchy with cultural um movements like uh communism that are that tend to be more left-leaning right where it was where the revolution was about freedoms that were more related to uh less who was in charge and more what the system of government was doing to make your lives better which is something that we seem to have been kind of going very far from as we're moving more towards the right but do you get what i'm saying like what i'm asking so like i'm very curious about how how that plays out in china because um because it's probably much more complicated than even i'm able to comprehend right yeah as an outsider speak about it i'm not a historian or do i have like you know very good background on that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. but from my own personal research and from my family's history i can only tell the story that i know which is that um you know a place like hong kong that has happened before in Shanghai. Like Shanghai fell around World War II, right? And it used Shanghai to be a colony. French, it, was, it was a French concession. It's not a colony. It's called a concession, but it's something like a colony, you okay. know. And um, 
and it was prosperous and it offered Sino people a lot of opportunities. And What's Sino people? Sino is the same as basically saying Chinese, except like I like using Sino more because not everyone is comfortable with the term Chinese, especially me. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally understand that. I yeah, I so, just I just learned uh, one for uh, uh, Middle Eastern, which I can't remember, but it's on my uh, Lebanese American experiences episode. So I didn't hear Lebanese. that episode this morning. But, oh, you did? Yeah, oh, so, thank you. Yeah. So, um, what was I saying? Yeah, like. Places that were colonies were actually safe haven for people from like the crazy stuff that was happening outside of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, the Qing Dynasty just ended. Like, people started a revolution to overthrow it, and then for a little while we had the Republic of China. But then, like after that, it's like civil war between uh, between China and and um, I mean b- between between the KMT and the CCP, the Communist Party and the you know, current Taiwan's party, the party that turned into current Taiwan. Okay. And how, okay. So, and then, and then uh, there's ju- also Japanese invasion in World War II. And so like, you know, those colonies and Hong Kong became a safe haven for people to, you know, refugees to just flee to. And my, my, my grandparents lived in Shanghai for a little bit. And then when that, you know, when that wasn't going well, they fled to Hong Kong. Yeah. So it's like for, for some people, for some Sino people, it's like we look at it this way. It's like, well, every time white people made a carved out a space, it, it's great. We just go there and it's great, you know. Mm-hmm. But everything else that's run by our own people, it's never great. Yeah. And I'm not saying that's a correct point of view or anything, but that's a true like that's that's something that people think. Well, China is actually one of those things that is very complicated right now. So I don't even really know, like. At this point, dude, I just think it's safer for me to just acknowledge that I don't, I can't trust any information that I'm getting about anything. Mm-hmm. So, so, it, so to me, it's interesting to actually hear. To, here's, you know, obviously, what you're describing is like uh, fleeing, right? Um, which is something that is also very much part of American or I mean Cuban American experience, like that that sense of diaspora, and and it's weird because I don't always associate. Chinese immigration like that. I never, I mean, this is the first time I think of it like that. And that, um, I don't know how, maybe it has to do with like how uh, far removed we are from that experience of like uh, China, uh, uh, you know, like, I mean, America used to have a lot more of an ad- ad- adversarial, <laughs> you know, white people, like you were saying, <laughs> that could carve out good spaces were much more adver- adversarial to um, ch- the Chinese government. And yeah. yeah, and so, but now that there's like, uh, you know, now that it's just a monolithic, um, or not monolithic, but like, I don't know. I just think that like people in our in our government are very jealous of some of the things that we hear about over here, whether or not they're true, about like ability to censor and ability to control. <laughs> Uh, dialogue yeah, so that's actually one of my biggest worries is that like you know they want to turn this into like a u.s versus china thing but ultimately what i worry about is just powerful people linking up to oppress grassroots people right a hundred percent yeah i mean china is developing these really great technology that works great for controlling a massive population and my worry is that well what if the other democratic so-called democratic country sees this and they are like well i want to use that too on my own people you know that's my biggest worry i honestly don't really i don't trust people in power i don't think most i don't i don't think most people do you know but uh yeah yeah well i think maybe that's more of a common thing now because i do find that I, i don't know what houston is like but i do find that out here in la talking about this in certain circles <laughs> you know and talking about just like like it's just uh it's it's a party pooper it's like dude we're here to talk about how how great everything is <laughs> <laughs> i'm also not great at parties is i guess what i'm saying <laughs> even though i did experiment with drugs when i was younger uh but um that's interesting uh, and, and uh, okay, so then can you explain to me the difference between Mandarin and Cantonese? Like, I guess those are like, I know that there's like, like, as you were saying, there's really specific um, language differences. 
and it gets very subdivided, which I understand because Italy, you know, you go to Naples and you can't fucking understand Italian because <laughs> it's Nap Napoletano. It's not even, it's like its own uh, dialect. But, yeah, what's the phrase for it? Like mutually, like something. Basically, like the the like people who's uh, if two people one speak Mandarin, one speak Cantonese, they won't be able to understand each other. I forgot the linguistic term for that, but mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, so, but how does that like what regions speak what and like what historically does that have to do with all of this? I think historically China has a lot of dialects and it's just only recently that you know after the cultural revolution and the ccp start pushing for like you know all mandarin kind of policy that okay people were forced to learn mandarin at school but i think people definitely still do speak their own dialect at home oh okay. um, shanghainese still do that i know that you know shanghainese is still spoken at homes but i but i don't know what's the state of like you know has shanghainese declined or something I don't know, but in Hong Kong we we teach it we we teach in uh, we teach Chinese and Cantonese because Chinese is a written language, right? Like that's how China was able to be such a big empire because they have this standardized script. Uh huh. And you know, and they use that to basically in order to be part of China, you just have to be, like write stuff in this script. You can't speak your dialect, but you have to write in the script so that information can be you know, distribute it. Oh, that's fascinating. That's how a lot of big empires operate. I'm reading this book called Imagine Communities by uh, Benedict Anderson. Okay. And he's covering that in like the first few chapters about how like most of the big civilizations um, had a standardized written language. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. that's... That, it's... It, I mean, obviously it makes me feel about... It, it makes me think about like just how... Uh, you know, we all watch movies in English, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and who is responsible for that? I actually think that it's it's one of the things that like we don't talk about when we talk about or we don't talk about enough when we talk about white supremacy is that like the British Empire gets a lot of credit for fighting against uh, the Nazis and they deserve it. It was a fucking horrible thing. But in the end, what happened is they had this like pretty brutal empire as well right mm -hmm. uh, maybe because they had that they were able to fight nazism so effectively but um you know they weren't very nice to india <laughs> as history will tell you uh specifically churchill a and um and so what i think that what happens is it, 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 like his uh, as far as i my understanding of history is that you have this empire that just gets depleted fighting germany and then the u.s comes in and it's almost like the english sort of hand off the empire or the pass the torch pass the torch to the u.s yeah and uh and all of that shit is so weird to me because it's sort of like the unspoken thing about America. Like it's base that's basically white supremacy. <laughs> you know? Like Yeah, and then they're, they're linking up. They're linking up to like, you know, I'm passing on the like head bitch in charge white supremacy position to you. Yeah. And and not just that, like, but like also wink wink nod nod, there's like an ethnic uh lineage there as well right because mm -hmm. there are un American and, and then you get into the uh, discussion of like colonies <laughs> and who are the colonies that succeed and then become colonizers right like you 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 have Australia which was like a colony but they're doing mm -hmm. okay <laughs> and America's doing okay and then like uh yeah I don't know I have very uh, weird feelings about a lot of stuff yeah. right now yeah um yeah I was so like a little bit about current events or like you know past week um you remember how like we closed the consulate in houston the chinese consulate in houston no i didn't yeah so america uh the u.s wanted to close the chinese consulate in houston gave them like a 72 hour notice or something to like move out of the building and then they started like burning documents in their backyard like oh. in the consulate and people are like, why are you burning stuff? You know, <laughs> like it, it looks really suspicious. And then, of course, like the Chinese 
um, State Department or their equivalent of State Department responded that um, this is like standard international procedure or something like that. <laughs> but anyway, so, you know, the, uh, the Chinese netizens are all really mad, right? Because, you know, China runs on this kind of like sensationalized nationalism. Like, and sometimes they have to be careful about actually what their own people, like regular Chinese people say, because sometimes they can say some really ridiculous stuff that can really offend another country and that doesn't help with like diplomacy, you know? Yeah. But anyway, there were just, so the Chinese netizens were calling for, we should close the uh, U.S. consulate in Hong Kong. And then, you know, and then people start digging up the history of the U.S. consulate in Hong Kong. It was established the year after the, the British acquired Hong Kong Island. The U.S. consulate? Like, okay. Yeah, so it has 177 years of history in Hong Kong. And... Yeah, that's pretty ridiculous. Like the first year that Hong Kong is open as like a port, as like a colony, you know, they already had their consulate. Yeah. Like U.S. had the consulate there. In, wow, in wow, this wow. British yeah. Yeah, that's kind of fucking crazy. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, and also, and also it has a special status. It's, it's a consulate for Hong Kong and Macau. And because Hong Kong and Macau are considered special administrative regions, that, that consulate in Hong Kong, the U.S. consulate in Hong Kong, reports directly to the State Department rather than reporting to the ambassador in Beijing. Okay. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Because, like, Hong Kong has always been this, like, really st st strategic place for, uh -huh. you know, all these really, like, under-the-table stuff, you know? Oh, I mean, yeah. That's... Between the East and the West, yeah. Yeah. It's funny, um... When I was in school, I did a paper on why Florence was Florence because Florence was one of the city states that didn't need to have a, a military or an army. And it's basically because it was like positioned in the only place that you could get from the south to the north because there's a mountain pass there. And then because the Arno, like it, it's passable there. But as you get down towards Pisa, it splits up and it becomes like really hard to cross. So there's definitely places that are located and this one's, you know, particularly interesting because it has to do with, like, how uh, topography and the challenges of travel change over time, right? So mm -hmm. as opposed to, like, when we were d dealing with city-states, just having this colony. How big is Hong Kong? Um, I don't know the number right off my head. No, yeah, I'm, I'm looking it up. I, that, that was just the first question that popped into my but head. But the thing is, even if you look it up on the map, you have to notice that, like, actually a lot of land are still just, like, hills and mountains. Oh, really? Yeah, so, like, actually very few small amount of spaces are developed. And so that's why it's really dense. Yeah, and also it's hard to get scale, like, if you're not comparing it to, like, New York. <laughs> you know, or, or, like, you get what I'm saying, like, yeah, it, I don't have any point of comparison or like any other. Um... So I'm looking at the map right now. Is it? It's it's a peninsula, right? Mm -hmm. I'm actually yeah, it's I've... attached to China. It's so attached to you China. You see that like island that looks like a frog? Like that's the first piece of land that the British acquire in the Treaty of Nanking. Wait, which one? And then they they <laughs> gradually acquire more, like you know, the peninsula part. Is it uh, Lantau Island that's the one that looks like a frog? No, Hong Kong Island. Oh, Hong Kong Island. All right, I'll have to look at it later. Now now I want to see the <laughs> this shape, but I can't, uh, like, <laughs> it's not uh, it's not as easy to recognize for me as the boot in Italy. I'll look at it oh, later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just all distracted it's now like looking at the map. a jumping frog, a jumping frog. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I, I, I see it. I'm just like, I just haven't hit that point where I see it and I can't unsee it. So anyway, we'll I will not distract uh, distract from the conversation any further. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Pictures. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, so you but you are pretty active uh, as an artist right now. Like not not to pivot entirely. So uh, am I? Am, is that correct? Like you're you you're pretty actively producing. Uh, it seems. Yeah, I'm full time only doing art right now. So, you know, I run my Etsy store and I make original pieces. Yeah. What's your Etsy store? The Etsy store. Oh, Etsy store. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh yeah. 
that's that's awesome yeah because like you were i i mean i kind of knew i was that was a very leading question because i kind of knew because you told me that you were like super flexible with your schedule and i'm so <laughs> grateful <laughs> but that's awesome that's like uh that's kind of the dream uh, um congratulations on that i'm very Thank very you. impressed with anybody's work ethic who can accomplish that because fuck <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not like making bank or anything. I'm just no, making but... barely enough. But you know, I'm getting. I'm trying to expand. But also, like, it sucks because I like to make everything by hand. Yeah. Like, I don't like. I don't just send stuff off to like another company to like make it for me and then like resell it. Like, I, I just don't like doing that. Wait. You know? So but... you mean you don't? You don't uh, like by that? Do you mean you're not? Uh, are Are you making prints or you just don't hire out other painters to paint your work? Oh, I mean the prints, the merchandise. Yeah. Oh, the merchandise. Okay, yeah. so you, so you, you, you make prints of your. I'm just trying to fucking learn marketing right now. <laughs> this is no yeah, longer I mean, a conversation about art. Ultimately, ultimately, I feel like making my own prints is like cheaper than sending it out, unless I was making really large prints. But then mm -hmm. I was just charge the client. You know, if they yeah. want to buy a large print that's custom sized to their liking, then I would just like you know. And what send it what to are these? Are these screen prints that you're making or what, what kind no, of No, they're just digital prints. But okay. like there's still like skills to, you know, to have to run it digital. Oh, Good hell digital yeah. Print, I gave up know? on photography. I, I just thought it was going to be really easy. But no, there's still. <laughs> when I bought my printer, I watched a bunch of review videos. And there's this guy that runs a YouTube channel that talks about printers. And like when I was looking at reviews for my printer, he was like, this is the Lamborghini of printer. Oh no, he said this is the Ferrari of printer. You don't just like buy it and let it sit at home. You gotta run it. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, a lot of race car reference. <laughs> I just love that you uh, referenced Lamborghini twice. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he said Ferrari. He said this is the Ferrari of printers. You yeah, but I. I, I feel like I, I feel like two one of two things is is happening now. Like you've either never said the Lamborghini of anything ever before in your life or two, two that's your go to. <laughs> <laughs> I have said Lamborghini. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get that feeling that I that's used to, the one. I used to work for this guy that sell used car parts on eBay, so I was actually really good. Like you can just give me a car part like usually they're headlights. You can just give. I can just take a look at it, and I already know like what brand and what model usually. Oh, okay. But I think I've lost that skill now. So. <laughs> I kind of wanted to shout out like headlights and see if you could draw them for me, and be no. like, Crown Victoria, Miami, Florida they cop are, car. They are very beautiful though. They they are actually very beautiful because I have to take a lot of photos of them. So. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, I mean, who's going to disagree that Lamborghini is beautiful? It is, it is not the Lamborghini of, of cars. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, so, okay, let's go back to more serious stuff, though, because that I, I, I just had to acknowledge that because that is very impressive and, uh, you know, something that I uh, admire and, and look up to and respect a lot that, uh, you know, we talk a lot about, like, uh, how socialism isn't necessarily always evil and like, you know, that maybe services from the government can be good sometimes on the show. But I also uh, have mad respect for the for people who can play the game as it is. <laughs> yeah. And and you are you have there's no way you got here without grinding. So like, let's just uh, as 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 a, a, a supporter of artists, I got to give props to that because fuck, man, <laughs> that's some <laughs> real shit. And you're doing it with an Etsy shop. So like now I want to open mine and uh and and stuff like that so going back to china um i mean or we can talk about something else like your topic was a little bit more specific and less about china do you want to go back to that i just had so many questions my topic again imagination <laughs> yeah Sorry. imagining topic imagining traditions like and that's actually a really fertile space to explore and like you know it can still be political without being specifically about china I mean, the example that I wanted to mention yeah. was that, like, Hong Kong recently, the Democratic camp recently, like, held their own primary uh -huh. to select a, you know, so that everyone, to select a candidate so everyone can focus their votes on that candidate so that they can, they don't have to split up the votes and they can make sure that the Democratic candidate can get into the Legislative Council. Uh -huh. But, so like, they did all this by, like, airing their own Democratic debate on YouTube like a few organizations got together and just did it on YouTube themselves. 
and then like people actually like help each other to find the voting stations and stuff and just like volunteers working people donating their ipads to be used for voting you know and they made it happen that was pretty crazy yeah. that's imagination right like yeah well, the, I mean, and that's why I like the point of your topic, because a lot of that shit is happening right now in America, too. Right. A lot of people's worlds and traditions are like, wait, what's the value in all of this shit? Um, it's it's like it, it's always just beneath the surface. And I, I just started working again, which I'm very grateful for, because the last uh, recession, I did not have a job. And I was one of the people that struggled a lot with that. Uh, and to the point where I just created a career as a as a soccer coach because that was the only thing that like I was getting any traction on because mm-hmm. uh, it was like super competitive. So I, I I have a job now and I'm grinding super hard. Uh, but going back to that reality, it's still not the old reality because you know there's limitations on what we can do as a society anymore. We can't just have like mad people in a small space. You know, so yeah. it's fucking crazy uh, like that. That is uh, that is something I think that. It's it, like without getting too. I mean, I, I, it's exhausting and I'm like over it, so I don't really want to talk too much about like electoral politics today, but you see, it, it does feel like there's like an attempt to try to keep the illusion alive from. Yeah, from both sides and Mm -hmm. uh and it's hard to look at that and and be empowered by it uh uh, whereas like these conversations i think are 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 nurturing me through these fucking crazy times whereas like if i fucking sat and watched every tit for tat piece of shit like reaction like i know what i think about all these people (laughs) yeah well (laughs) i that's why i kind of want to talk about this because i kind of want to encourage more imagination for example like you know people were um talking about defending the police and imagining community policing in different ways like i mean that takes a lot of imagination and i think imagination is actually a lot of work you know it's not just like imagine you got to have the fundamentals down you got to research like how to do something you got to look at how other people do it you know if there are other models around the world or something and then you got to imagine something that works for your own community specifically yeah and then uh on the flip side of what your original like uh topic which i i can just pretty much call thesis statement and that's what we're talking about right now is the the idea that also imagination can keep you fucking trapped, <laughs> right? Like imagine traditions yeah. and like, you know, I think that there's, uh, it's, it's almost, it's, it's interesting. The, the thing with the statues, cause it's such a symbolic battle. Um, and I'm not against it, but it is like, just like, uh, it's uh, the the cliche is rearranging the deck terriers on the Titanic where it's mm-hmm. like, uh, I also worry about it. I think there's a legitimate thing to be said about, uh, you know, it's fair to want to tear down the statues because of like the, 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 the statues are up and it's not like in Italy where, uh, or in Germany where it's left like the people that put them up are no longer in power. Right. Uh-huh. So I understand the need to, the, and I have support the desire to take that shit down. I'm not like speaking against it. What I, I am concerned about is that the uh, on the other end of it, the people who are in power and that are promoting that shit, um, there's like a whitewashing that, th- that from their standpoint, <laughs> you know, like to harp on that, I think that there's like an education on the way to like appease uh, on means of appeasement. Like instead of actually giving people economic empowerment, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, like just do the symbolic thing and be done, you know? Yeah. And imagine a world where we don't celebrate these things, but like the whole system is a celebration of it. (laughs) And you know. I mean, when that was happening, I definitely have a lot of ambivalences about it. Like, I'm not yeah. really sure. That's a great word for that. Thank like, you. Yeah, because I do support the sentiments behind it. Yeah. But like, at the same time, it reminded me so much of what happened in the Cultural Revolution that like, I yeah. was 
I'm not having direct PTSD. I guess it's like generational PTSD because I grew up hearing about these stories of like, you know, confiscation of property by the Red Guards and like the Red Guards like um, dragging out people out into the village square to like, um, to what is it called? Like they just like circle the person and like start pointing at them and shaming them, public shaming. Okay. And then sometimes they would even be lynched. <laughs> And, um, Sorry <laughs> you know, for for being for being land owning for being a intel intellectual for you know representing the old traditions or whatever yeah. that you know so well, and, that... and they definitely did take down mo monuments you know they yeah. destroyed the gate of the old university or something like that you know yeah, yeah. and and like and and obviously there's a lot to be said you know like I think that uh, um. Again, ambivalence is the key phrase here, but mm -hmm. I do think that like a lot of times people don't realize that they support totalitarianism or fascism when they are acting in good faith They uh, from their standpoint, right? Where they think they're doing something good yeah. and they're just like silencing certain things like... Um, and that, and again, I, I, I totally feel like, yeah, uh, you know, people who are descendants of slaves sh should not be walking around seeing a monument that was put up in the sixties. Like that's not at all what I'm talking about. What I, I think that what, but what I think that we're talking about is that like, there's a cunning <laughs> to the imperialist power and to the fascism where like if, for example, I think that a lot of, um, a lot of like real genuine work that people are doing critical thought critical discourse that people are having in regards to language right now is very much valuable but then i think you have powerful elites who take that and then they're like they dilute it into this like weaponized fascist silencing mechanism that doesn't serve the principles behind the spirit of like you know like for example the basic most basic example is that in in the era of trump like aclu is no longer a, the aclu of the 60s where they would protect the rights of nazis to, for free speech right like so mm -hmm. it's a very difficult conversation to even have because you're like you end up in some ways supporting vile sh vile <laughs> shit right uh but I don't know. It's 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 it, it's it's a hard thing to like sort of pin down. It's like so nebulous even trying to talk about it, right? Like where do you where do you draw the line and where is like something well, free speech or where is something fascist? For me, like to make it into like bring it back down to like things we can do. It's like from the Hong Kong protest what I learned is like there's like a very um strong divide between like the people who are for pe only peaceful protests, protests that have permits, then they'll go. If it doesn't have permits, they don't go. And people who are just like, no, we need to like throw Molotovs and like, you know, spray paint everything. And, you know, and, yeah. but like, it's remarkable that this time those two groups have gotten along really well. And, you know, people who aren't comfortable going out there to destroy public property, like older people or even just middle-aged people, they just decide, oh, well, if I, I can't, do that myself like I can't find it in myself to agree with that but and I also I can't do it but at the same time I support these kids I support yeah. the cause like they're working for the cause and so people would do things like I would make them food I'll bring them food or like I would go you know drive my car there and you know pick them up after the thing is over and like make sure they don't get caught yeah you know they're not doing those actions like throwing molotovs and like destroying public stuff but they are you know acting as backup for those people and they bail them out they you know to donate money to bail them out they do get caught you know yeah like if you want to do it okay i'm not gonna like chastise you but i will do like i will do things that can support you in other ways because mm -hmm. you know for example i will donate to like bail funds because i don't agree with you know them being incarceration yeah 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 but I can't find it in myself to want to do the exact exact same thing that they're doing. And I'm not going to comment on it because I, I don't, I'm not doing it myself. You know, I don't feel like I should comment on too much, you know, of oh, yeah. that particular action, you know, because yeah, I don't yeah. have to do it myself. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. No, I mean, I, uh, I definitely am a guest in any protest space at this point because 
like you i mean there's there's things that i'm willing to try to have discussions about but the reality of the fucking world is very terrifying to me and i'm a delicate person <laughs> yeah and I, I, mean, I understand what you're saying like i completely like i also have those worries about like where we're going like where is the general kind of thinking and sentiments going will it lead to something that is not what we actually wanted from the beginning i do worry about that but oh no i'm I actually think... i was never really against the protest side of it i, I my uh just to clarify i, I and, and not that that's like uh I don't even necessarily think that that's what you thought. I just like I feel like maybe you're backpedaling because you feel like you implied it. But uh, to to just be clear, like um, my problem is not with the protest movement. My problem oh, yeah. my problem is never with the protest movement. My problem is never with the people that are struggling for power. Uh, my concern is the people that have cunning and have resources and apply them you know, to harm those movements, right? And co-op yeah. those movements, right? Like, for example, even just the fact, like, I understand there's, like, an academic thing to talk about in terms of, like, oh, yeah, if you really look at history, whatever, blah, 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 you can always look at history and say that, like, violence worked and violence didn't work, <laughs> right? And the, yeah. the, the, the uh, so I wouldn't even, like, deign to, like, discuss, to, to put, to cast judgment on anybody trying to fight for their fucking freedom right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I am somebody who is happy to be employed <laughs> by a corporation. And, uh, you know, so, like, uh, I try to exercise whatever freedoms I have. My concern is always with, like, for example, like just the idea that we're having this conversation that we even need to clarify things. I don't think that people that agree with us and are like understand the genuine interest in having the, that we have in having this discussion uh, would believe that we're acting in bad faith. But to some level, we also need to protect ourselves from being misrepresented as we're having this this conversation because it's so easy to just dismiss people who are trying to have sincere uh thoughts about oppression um and and like you know you can just take a snippet and like put that shit on instagram you know i <laughs> yeah and so it's it's fucked up it, it but but i you know and i think that like i agree with your approach like i I've always been like, you know, curious about these kinds of things and always been somewhat marginalized for ha trying to discuss them because a lot of people don't want to think about the fact that we're sitting on wealth that was extracted from other people, like all of us in, in this country. Right. And so. Yeah. So. But to even fucking say that is so offensive, especially because an election is coming up. And that that's my concern. Like, those are the fascists that I'm talking about. Not, like I said, there's two tiers of what's happening. There's actual di sincere dialogue happening in communities of color, in queer communities, in trans communities, where we're all trying to fucking learn from each other and how not to hurt each other because we all understand that there's like this uh, powerful struggle. And then you have all these people that co-op that shit and are like, oh, you're a fucking hater. You're canceled. And like, yes, there is a place for cancellation. I'm not even saying that there's not. But uh, I don't think that like Deborah Messing or uh, Alyssa Milano should be in charge of that, you know, and people like that. Mm -hmm. um, just elite, rich fucking people in this country, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like you can, it's, I mean, it's, it's commonly used in China too, like the way the, you know, it, it's always like top down. It's never like really grassroots up, you know, like all these sentiments that are given all these messages that they use to brainwash people to like publicly on the internet, put someone on trial, you know? Yeah. Oh like yeah. Sometimes does come sometimes it does come from like just the internet like just like regular people on the internet getting like because they've been brainwashed with this you know and they yeah. can just do it on their own now like they don't yeah, need yeah, someone yeah. Up top to give them a message because you've trained them to do such a thing but that's what i mean like they've all been manipulated into having this kind of like chinese ethnic centric nationalism that's i mean they they complain about how people are discriminating against them but really like they are also extremely xenophobic you know <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah like I forgot like which which company I think it was Sarah or like 
I think Chanel also had like a makeup ad where like Chinese netizens start complaining about how like they always only feature women that look stereotypically Asian. Yeah. Like when they feature an Asian Asian woman as their model, like they always only feature someone who has like, you know, slanty small eyes or something like that. And they're like, well, why don't they feature, you know, like like the stereotypical like K-pop looking type yeah, 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 yeah. face. Like why don't they feature those? You know, they they ask that. And I think Chanel does have a model that look kind of like that. But anyway, they only focus on when they don't, you know. And also it's like, well, my my question is like, I kind of look stereotypically Asian. And I'm asking, well, well, that face is also Asian. Like, why are you complaining? Why are you saying that they're being racist for using her? She's Asian. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not like they have someone in yellow face. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> so it's like, you know, there's so many layers of, like, self-hate in there. Like, yeah. so are you saying that only certain, like, you know, certain Asian women look stereotypically Asian and therefore they should not be used as these famous brands model or something? Like, yeah. I don't get it. You know, especially in your own country that you discriminate against these women a lot. You make them feel pressure to have plastic surgery. I mean, I was asked if I want to have plastic surgery, like, before my age is even double digit. What? Yeah, like, you know, adults ask me, like, you know, do you want to get your eyes done or something when you're grown up? You know, just, like, casually asking. I mean, it's not even, like, it's not even, like, taboo or anything. I mean, I, yeah, I, I... I can only speak from like my culture. I don't want to comment on like other Asian countries because I don't know they could be like myths, but it's definitely a thing. Wait, so what they wanted you what do they, what do they want you to do your eyes? They didn't want me to do it. They just wonder. It's like it's like asking a kid, "Do you want to like what what kind of job do you want to have when you grow up?" You know, yeah. it's like kind of asking that. They ask me like, "Do I want to get my eyes done?" Or like, "Do I want to have like just plastic surgery in general when I'm grown up?" Um, but okay, yeah, but uh, cuz but like i i i don't want to fixate on the eyes but what do they want what, like what is the implication there like what is the eye surgery that you would have i mean i don't have double eyelid and that's the i think that's what's, why they ask what's double eyelid okay there's like a line on top of your eyes like if you have one then you have double eyelid if you don't have one then you're monolid what the because fuck having that are you talking about? Allow, because having that line allow for like eyeliner to sit there very comfortably without you having to like draw a lot of eyeliner on, and it, like it just make your eyes look like it's really set in, like a doll. You know what I mean? Like, like it has a lot more dimensions. I don't. Like, kn- I don't even I don't, know how I, to ask I questions. I don't think it's really true, but that's how it's explained. You know? Yeah. yeah. I okay. I have no, I've never heard anything that fucking weird to me <laughs> that yeah. you were at the, So that's what they were at. Is, so it's, it sounds like it might be like a, is it a, is it a fat shaming thing or is there, or is it just a genetic structure thing? It's a genetic trait. Monolith okay. is a genetic trait. But okay. also I think sometimes monolith people, as they get older, the double eyelid thing will set in because you know like you lose baby fat on your face and your eyes may be more sunken okay. as you get older but that seems but, more desirable to have a uh, double eyelid yes bigger eyes in general yeah and a higher nose bridge i pinched my nose so much as a kid because like they keep telling me that if i pinch my nose more my nose bridge more that like it'll get higher like my my nose bone will like come in or something Oh my god, I have a Roman nose that I resent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like I I didn't have both of those things. I don't have a high 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 nose bridge and I don't have double eyelids. And so that's why people ask me that question. Okay. And uh just to remind everybody, you're from the white China, right? The Hong Kong? The white colony? The white- <laughs> yeah, I'm from Hong Kong. I was actually born in British colonial Hong Kong. I was born in 1993, which is like four years before the handover. So uh, that was one year before I discovered that I really liked Smashing Pumpkins. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> so we had different childhoods. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean I was 14. I was 13 at that time. So oh, yeah, okay. that's crazy. Yeah, cool. that's uh, the generational thing is also fascinating to me but um because well i mean because i learned about well i probably became aware of cultural revolution before you were born but i came aware of it became aware of it from 
a w- very Western, like propagandized perspective, right? Mm-hmm. Where it was like, oh, they also live in kind of like Cold War a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, my mom loves to say like when we argue about like politics and uh, and she's like, when, and when we talk about like Russia meddling, and she's like, well. I think it's just because I lived through the Cold War and I'm like, Mom, I did too. <laughs> that shit was long. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I don't know. I It just feels like we kind of... Do you have anything that you want to finish up on? Like, I, I, just, I mean, I'm just uh, blown away by <laughs> the fucking horrors of growing up <laughs> that, you know, the, how, how specific you can be made, culturally specific and uh, phenotypically specific. You can get um, like humiliated by people that are part of your community. You know. I mean, no. I mean, if you write my artist statement on my website, like I said, like I escaped Hong Kong. It's like <laughs> you know, I escaped Hong Kong culture, and it's parallel to my families always escaping from communist China, you know, yeah. whether politically and economically, you know, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, I love Hong Kong, but at the same time, like, there's a reason why I didn't go back, despite all odds, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. no, I totally get yeah. it. Yeah, I, uh, that's heavy shit, man. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but also, I, I don't dwell on that stuff too much like I, I dwell on specific things like beauty standards and how I feel about it you know I write uh-huh. about it and stuff and I make work about it I've always made work about beauty you know even if it's evolved now but yeah like I, I don't know it's it's always going to be complicated and that's why I said all of this stuff is imagination and it's yeah. okay to just let it be imagination you know yeah definitely it's and it and it's uh it's all it's imagined things from very from perspectives of powerful people like we always like condescendingly think like haha history's written by the winners and then we cite history all the time you know <laughs> yeah and imagination the great thing is it's as real as you let it be and yeah. it's as- not real as you make it you know all right we're best friends now because uh we <laughs> we believe we we agree on self-deception and belief very much <laughs> and that is a very personal thing to uh, to 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 understand <laughs> to connect with yeah. someone on so yeah we're, we'll, well i'll definitely have you back on uh okay. I, and it's been really really fucking enlightening <laughs> you know yeah, it was- talking yeah i definitely want to i feel one of the things that i wish i had made more of a specific request to learn about and i would encourage everybody to learn about it on their own is the uh cultural revolution because it it really is as as i understand it and you can correct me if i'm wrong it's like an anti-intellectual movement which Uh goes towards our ambivalence of academia right like where academia is problematic but then it's even worse if you start to like fucking wipe your history out you know and uh um, yeah and yeah i mean i was gonna go off on something else but we're gonna end there <laughs> yeah can can yeah, you uh good. can you uh promote uh th- some stuff do you have anything that you need to promote um i have my instagram account it's t-s-z-k-a-m uh underscore a-r-t art um, and my Etsy is also like on my website. It's there's a link on my website, and you can just find my website on my Instagram too. It's just my name dot com. So. Oh, okay. Oh, is the yeah. one that I'm following uh, the personal Instagram? No, it's my art Instagram. Oh, okay. The one that I yeah. have is uh, oh, it, oh the underscore is between the okay. I never mind. Uh, I will cut that out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. The part where I correct you about your uh, Instagram. <laughs> no, but I've literally had people get it wrong, and I'm like, I'm just tired. Anyway, thank it's you like, so much. I want to say ccam.com. Like, no one's going to know how to spell that, and so I just spelled it out. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then I realized that I'm dyslexic, and I can't, like, visualize when people spell things out for me so that that's where we we we, we cross wires or i oh, that's that's where my error my overconfidence was in my ability to like do that anyway it's been so much fun thank you so much i will talk to you soon uh it's it was great to learn about china and houston and i want to hear more somewhere down the line 
uh, very yeah. soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.